Welcome to the Les Isles Wellbeing Show. And today I am joined by Dr. Sophie Mort, also known as Dr. Soph, a psychologist who is on a mission to get psychology out of the therapy room and into our lives in a way that's accessible, practical, and easy to understand. And I have to say, she is absolutely brilliant. I have learned a huge amount recording this podcast, so I hope that you seriously enjoy it. Well, after working on the front line of NHS mental services from London's Homerton Hospital, Sophie left her position as a clinical psychologist after she realised that the system just wasn't working for many. Now, she believes that we shouldn't have to wait until we're really struggling to find out how to better manage and understand our emotions. And this is something that we can all easily learn and we can start to put it into practice in our everyday lives. And she's been doing a brilliant job of making basic psychology much more accessible on her blog, on her popular Instagram account, and most recently in her brand new book, A Manual for Being Human. Well, we have just had the most fascinating chat about how she found herself working in this field, the influence of our childhood on later life, as well as our emotions, where they come from, how to manage them, and especially talking about anxiety and things that threaten to overwhelm us. And, you know, the episode here is absolutely bursting with practical advice for a happier life. So I do hope that you enjoy it and that you share it widely with friends family or anyone, frankly, in need of a bit of a boost. And don't forget that if you'd like to watch our chat today, the video podcast is also available on the Liz Our Wellbeing YouTube channel. And as always, I am really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Instagram after the show. So without further ado, let's hear it from Dr. Soph. So Sophie, it's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. And I know that you have written a great article for my magazine as well. So it's lovely to kind of do this 360 thing and bring the whole thing to life. So welcome. So looking forward Thank to so this uh, this conversation. No, it's it's great. It, it, it's really good to be able to bring it to life here. And I'm really interested actually to know a little bit about your background and where your interest in psychology first started. What was your what was your starting point here? Well, it's funny because I think um, many people assume that people come to therapy and go down the path of being a psychologist because as a young person, they were determined to help people. And I do know people who went down that route. Yeah. Mine is a little bit more personal um, because at the age of 18, out of nowhere, I started having panic attacks. And prior to the panic attacks, I was incredibly confident. One of those teenagers who perhaps believed nothing could go wrong. And then the first panic attack hit and it just totally derailed my life. You know, I was studying yeah. psychology, um, studying art, sorry. And I didn't know anyone who'd had a panic attack before. Yeah. I didn't have any information on what was happening. So how, how did it manifest lost. itself? Well, my heart started racing one day and it came along with thoughts such as I'm going to lose my mind or I'm having a heart attack. That was the only two Wow. options I could think of and then when I realized I probably wasn't having a heart attack and it was panic the only information I had to hand was from the media right so one flew over the cuckoo's nest is way before my time but I had seen it and I was thinking oh my word okay there's the people who are well and there's the people who are unwell in inverted commas and the people yeah. who are unwell fall into the category of the mad or the bad and I just thought this is it my life is over and anyway, what, it's not an what, unhappy what story. triggered that? I mean, look, looking back, what what triggered that? Do, do, mm. you know, was there something going on in your life that that created that situation? Mm. And I think at the time, happen? at the time, it felt like it felt out of the blue. Looking back, I recognise it was a mixture of um, hyper perfectionism, putting a lot of pressure on myself, mm. hyper independence, and 
unresolved stuff from being younger and um, rather a wild year at university, which meant I burnt out all of my resources. I was tired all of the time. Going to university is just a lot for some people. And I think the mix of all three just meant I experienced my first panic attack. And because I didn't know what it was, my fear of having another one caused the panic to become a cycle, Mm. which is common for most people. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you say that and you say that at that age and stage of life, because actually, I mean, this is something I've mm-hmm. never, never shared actually openly, but I had a panic attack. In fact, I had two when I was about 19 living in New York. And honestly, mm-hmm. it was the most frightening thing. One happened when I was in Bloomingdale's department store and oh, I, word, I yes. actually, I I thought I was about to die, like you. You know, I I thought that my mere yeah. my heart was racing. I couldn't understand what was going on. I'd never experienced anything like that before, and I thought immediately because I had a a physiological symptom. You know, something biologically was mm-hmm. happening inside my body. I thought it. You know, how can that be connected to my my brain and my mental health? Because you know, clearly something. Right. You know, maybe I've been poisoned, or maybe you know I've I've got yes. some unexpected heart defect that suddenly materialized yeah. um, and I ended up going to A&E uh, you know and it was of course and that's a very normal response actually I mean it's it, it, it is it is frightening isn't it so I guess it's good just to put it out there for anybody you know who is listening you know who may be experienced mm. you know something like this in the future that you know that these these things it's not just you know I'm feeling anxious it does create these physical symptoms and luckily I you know I only then mm. had had one more and I think by the time I'd been kind of talked down from that and I realized actually this is something that I can recognize and and cope with Mm -hmm. um did you experience many of those many panic panic attacks or or was it just a a brief interlude many and because of actually what you just said so because it sounds like you had that experience and in the moment felt like it might be something physical and dangerous yeah it sounds like afterwards you realized oh this is a panic attack and there's ways to cope Mm. because at 18 i didn't have any reference point or place to turn I thought oh no I'm going mad or I'm going to die and I'm too ashamed to tell anyone so that caused a cycle so when I actually got therapy when I spoke to someone who told me what panic was and said actually every symptom you have in your body whilst feeling terrifying makes sense and if you know that you're medically safe and have breathing exercises and grounding skills once I knew that and knew I could cope and knew what I would do in a situation when panic arose I didn't go (gasps) This is the end. I was like, okay, this Mm. is a panic attack. Right, you can recognize it. I know what to do. Yeah, call it out. Yeah. So leaving Mm. university, you know, you talk about art, but you you actually went into the NHS as a clinical psychologist. You You know, was your own personal experience then something that really drove that as a career? Oh, yeah. So I almost immediately dropped out of art school um, because once I'd got my anxiety under check, I just, I couldn't not, you know, I couldn't believe that once I understood panic, that no one was told this information before they needed it. Suddenly I had this drive to not only understand as much about myself as I could possibly learn. um, I also felt like if I can learn as much as I can, then I can share it with people before they need it. So they will never feel like that ashamed and terrified 18 year old girl that I was. Gosh, wow. And I think, you know, at school, we're talked a lot about how our body works, aren't we? You know, how our organs work and, you know, you sit through biology classes and you're kind of taught taught the basics. Yeah. You know, certainly back in my day, and I'm a lot older than you, but there was absolutely no reference whatsoever to to mental health or how the brain works or how our mood and and emotions Mm -hmm work you know do you do you think that there's enough of that now I mean I'm I'm out of the the loop really with sort of what's happening in 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 schools now but you know is there much that's being taught to to prepare us for what might happen later on 
I mean, I'm in my 30s and I've done an undergraduate, a master's and a doctorate in clinical psychology. And I only feel now like I really understand everything. So I think there is a reality that to teach everything to everyone young would be very difficult. But I do think you've hit on a really interesting point, which is... We learn so much in school, not just about our body. Think about, I learned about sin, cos, and tan, these mathematical um, terms that I'm never going to use again, <laughs> right? Never. They're not helping yeah. me in any way, any day of my life. But uh, I didn't learn a single thing about emotions, actually. Um, yeah. I didn't learn about the fight or flight response. No, basic And thing. so I mm. do think, yes, right? The basic, basic things. I didn't learn mm. that my thoughts aren't truths. You know, things that actually can change people's lives weren't taught to me. But again, I'm in my 30s, not, you know, 5, 10, I'm not a teenager. So I don't know exactly what's happening now. Mm. I do believe that um, stigma is shifting. And I do believe schools are trying harder to incorporate psychology into the um, everyday thinking. But I do hope (laughs) that very concrete, simple strategies could be incorporated into future lessons because there's definitely a big gap. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, you know, I've obviously read your book and congratulations on that because that is that is very, very recent and, uh, and you must be very excited about it. I absolutely love it. It's really genius. Um, and you talk in there about the two kind of biggest influences, if you like, that shape who we are, the environment that we grow up in, and then the things that happen to us are our kind of subsequent life events. How do the two relate together and, and which have the most impact on our mental health? Well, I think what's really important here is, um, so that you're talking about part one of the book and I'm absolutely Ooh. thrilled that you've read it. Honestly, it yeah. my heart. Um, I think um, there's one thing first. We are not only shaped by our environment and our life events. We're shaped by DNA. We're shaped by things that are outside of our control that are predetermined. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that in a book about psychology, I can't tell you which things were in your DNA. I can only tell you what I know shapes people. Right. And in terms of um, our early life events shaping us again, often people assume that that means childhood. Mm -hmm. And whilst, yes, the family you grow up in, those first few years of life are integral to brain development. The stories you tell about yourself, what you expect of others, relationships, how you see yourself. It's not just that, it's your school years, for example. I mean, when I, so when I was asked to write this book, um, I, well, when I was asked if I wanted to write a book, I assumed I'd only ever get a chance to write one book. Um, and I decided if I'm gonna leave one book on this planet, what, what do I want it to be? And I was like, I want it to be this manual that means that people can understand anything about themselves. You know, people come to therapy and the questions are always, why do I feel this way? So how did I get here? what's keeping me here and how to move forwards. Mm-hmm. And so this book answers everything. And chapter one, only chapter one is those first few years. Chapter two is adolescence, mm-hmm. identity development. Chapter three, and this is the bit that few people talk about, is how the media and the marketing and the films, basically, that you consume every day, how that shapes all of those factors too. Chapter four is so structural inequality, so prejudice and differences between identities and how they're seen in society. And then mm. chapter five are the life events you're talking about. So those are the two main factors, yes, that shape who we are and our brain develops during those early years when we're experiencing all of these things. But within those two main factors, there's so many different layers. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's start at the beginning then. So one of the things that I Ooh. found out um, through, you know, personal experience and, and issues within my own family is just how important those first couple of years are when a baby's Ooh. brain is, is forming and, and we're creating all these little folds in our brain. And people talk about, mm. you know, childhood trauma and, and you know, post traumatic childhood syndrome if you like um mm-hmm. how how true is that what's what's your take on that because it actually i think makes me very interested when i meet new people or i'm talking to them to talk about their early years because those early years do seem to be really formative and yes of course you can get over and you can work through things but surely 
from my understanding, that does leave a kind of a lasting blueprint, if you like, um, on those literally those first 24 oh. months of life and how they're handled. 100%. And I think you've nailed something, which is anyone listening, we need to say just because an experience happened in the past doesn't mean it's going to dictate your whole future. There is yeah. always hope. Your brain is always changing. We know about yes. plasticity now. Yeah. But um, babies come into the world when their brain's about a third fully developed. Really? And then it wires together. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's And I could Gosh. I could spend a whole to podcast debating why that is. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> So your brain wires together depending on who is around you, how they interact with you, and importantly, how safe you are. So right. if you think about an architect adapting the blueprints of a design to the terrain they are building on, mm -hmm. your brain adapts its development depending on the environment that you grew up in. So let's say we have two different kids, for example. Again, remember DNA, there's all sorts of predetermination that we are not able to talk about here. Mm. If you think about the first child growing up in safety, their brain learns, I can be calm. It is safe to, for me to be here. It doesn't have to constantly trigger a threat response to try and get you out of danger. Right. So this person's brain may wire together in what we might call like a calm setting. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. if you take another baby and put them in a chaotic environment, yeah. a dangerous environment for whatever reason, mm. their brain adapts to keep them safe. It's not going to put you on a calm setting. It's going to keep you in constant threat, looking out for anything that could go wrong, trying to predict in advance any danger that may come, you know, may come yeah. upon you so you can escape it or fight against it. So this person, as they grow up, are more likely to have a sensitive threat response. So what's really, really fascinating is um, I think... In the world, we often talk about um, symptoms, right? So such as um, anxiety, mm. high stress levels, um, being sensitive. But what we think of as symptoms are actually normally really amazing ways that people adapted. So the kid right. who grew up in danger actually developed a way of um, staying safe within that danger by being constantly aware of threat that could happen. But those are two extremes, right? Most yeah. people as a rule, we've been a kind of middle ground, right? Mm -hmm. In a place where it's generally safe, where generally someone's like, oh, I see that you're struggling. Let me help you with that. Yeah. So these early years dictate how our brain develops in multiple ways, which luckily I've documented all in the book, so I don't have to talk about it right now. <laughs> that so absolutely you do shape how you go forwards, but it's not yeah. that you're then going to be in trouble forever. Okay, good. Well, we'll, we'll come on to, to the good news. In terms of the baby's brain being only a third developed, if you like, or a third formed, at what stage of our lives then does it become this, you know, fully formed, you know, walnut shaped brain that, that is then encased in our, in our skulls? You're going to be surprised. Mm. <laughs> okay. Go in on. terms of fully, fully wired together and fully integrated, about 25. Yeah. 25 oh my goodness so you know so far I mean I'm a mother of five and you know I have you know several youngsters around me uh, of, of different ages so isn't that interesting you know as a parent particularly and I'm sure there'll be lots of parents listening to this that up until the age of 25 the actions and the words that we say and the things that we do can have a lasting Im impact in changing, influencing the shape and behavior of our offspring's brains up until the age of 25. 100%. I mean, yours and my brain are changing right now as we're internalizing each other's voices and hopefully quite compassionate mm. stances. Yeah. Um, and also it's more like um, the development kind of slows firstly. So you have this yeah. first three years and it's very intense. And then as an adolescent, you have this very intense period again. And it's not that really? your brain is in your head just kind of sprouting out different shapes. The brain is still a brain. It's just it hasn't finished wiring together in the same way. Wow. So the kind of final bit. And for some people, it'll be earlier than 25. But really, adolescence ends roughly at 25. We just don't talk about it. Okay. 
<laughs> so is, is there a sort of a growth spurt when things are, are key? I mean, I'm thinking of myself as a mother of two, you know, teens. Is, is there a key time, say, between the ages of, you know, 14 and 17 or something when we should be extra vigilant, perhaps, or extra helpful and careful? Well, I think what happens to the adolescent brain is so utterly fascinating. And the thing is, t uh, adolescence isn't necessarily 13 to 17. It's any time that they kind of hit puberty all the way to the age of 25. And I think, you know, as a parent when it's happening, because, for example, the adolescent brain, some fun facts. Um, OK, so one of the purposes of adolescence is to get that um, teenager to live an independent life. So the brain adapts to support this. It's absolutely wild. You'll definitely have seen this. The teenager goes from being really like, mommy, I love you. This is so great. Let's hang out all the time to this kind of slump. I don't want oh, to. Yeah. Only coming alive when someone, you know? Yeah. Suddenly yeah. they're thrilled when their friends get into it. Most of the time they're like, I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, really so kind of, you know, and they start to grunt, life. which is extraordinary. You know, there's sort of yes. lack, of, lack of verbal <laughs> yes, communication yes, yes. is staggering. <laughs> yes, but this is a really fantastic piece of evolution, which is uh -huh. if you imagine that so dopamine is this feel good chemical in our brain that uh, makes us want to do something more. For an adolescent, that level of dopamine, their baseline drops. So this means that their normal feeling is more like, huh, right? <laughs> and then only novel and risky tasks, specifically risky tasks that are like socially accepted or approved of by friends, only mm -hmm. novel and risky tasks cause, cause these spikes in dopamine. Really? So suddenly you have the teenager who's like, Let's go, oh yeah, I'll skateboard down that hill with no shin pads or a helmet on. Yes. <laughs> My goodness, and the so they, they are, is, they're wired to, to do that and, and, and yes. to seek that to get their dopamine hit. Yeah, well, they're why because this is how you get your teenager out of the house. If you imagine a bird leaping mm -hmm. from the nest, they're mm -hmm. not going to do that if they feel afraid. Whereas the teenager is more likely to learn about their identity. They're more likely to take risks that will get them to join clubs, that will get them to... Um, find out what they're capable of and we'll yeah. get them to leave the family nest if they feel thrilled by it, right? If they're like, oh, okay. I have to go out there and see my mates. Then we'll like to separate from the family, which is one of the last tasks of growing wow. up as a human. Um, it, interesting you talk about separation there because you've written about attachment styles in the book. Oh. So, you know, can, can we talk a little bit about what those are and interestingly how they can affect our relationships then going forward? 100%. So you mentioned blueprints earlier. Now, one of the ways that we see those early years of our lives playing out in present day, irrespective of how old you are, are our attachment styles. So if we imagine the word attachment purely means the bond you have with someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your attachment style, your experience of being related to in those first few years of life form the blueprints of your relationships later on. Right. So for example, let's say that you had a caregiver who, when you cried out, you knew that they would come for you in a good way. Support you, I mean, not come yep. for you. Yeah, no, you. yeah, no, no. Would, yeah. <laughs> yes, in a good way, in a good way. Yeah. They would see your distress, the mother bird, you know, chew it up like a worm and regurgitate mm -hmm. it back to you in a way that makes sense. If you knew that there was someone to support you and who cared about you, you'd develop what we call a secure attachment style. A blueprint that says, when I meet people in future life, they can and will want to be there to support me. I am worthy of love and attention. Right. Okay. Roughly 50% of the population have what we call a secure attachment style. As a general rule, when they go on to date later in life, um, they're less likely to feel anxious, less likely to avoid relationships, and often, but not always, um, get into relationships quite early on. Mm. Now, I'm going to out myself because people often feel quite judged when they hear that there's this other section of people that we call insecurely attached. I have an avoidant attachment style. Do not worry. This is not something pathological. Yes. <laughs> okay. So 
there's there's multiple mixes, but essentially, if you learned that you can't consistently rely on someone being there for you, you adapted in different ways. That so makes sense. If you learned that every time you cry out, right? Every time you cry out, you can rely on the fact that they're not going to be there for you. Mm. You might develop an avoidant attachment style, which means you become hyper independent. You stay mm -hmm. near people, but you much like a cat, you go near them on your own terms. Yeah. 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 That then the is, people I mean, learned that, that the people. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that that's that's fascinating. And it's very fascinating also, I think, for anybody starting over with a new relationship. Um, you know, whether this is a youngster listening or, you know, somebody coming out of divorce or just, you know, you know, creating new relationships mm -hmm. generally, be they friendships or romantic relationships. It's interesting, isn't it, to, to kind of, I mean, you don't want to get a resume of somebody's backstory and their upbringing, but, you know, as, as you get to know somebody yes. and, and you hear about their early childhood experiences and their family environment, mm -hmm. It would give us greater awareness, perhaps, of what that person needs from us and how we might expect them to respond. How fascinating to, yeah. to know I, that. I actually know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, go on. The video keeps delaying, and so I yeah, talk. Sorry. I don't see you speak. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no um, there, there is now more and more common practice of people meeting and dating and assessing each other's attachment styles, which I quite like. <laughs> So I think, you know, from what I'm picking up here as well, there is a positive to this because I think, you know, I always say knowledge is power. And I guess, you know, a lot of this is true with psychology as well. If we become aware of what's happened to us and how we can then better overcome something because we can acknowledge it and then hopefully move on or maybe, you know, re reformat our brain, rewire our brain. I mean, is, is that too optimistic or is that perfectly possible? Not at all. Not at all. So um, I'll just quickly say it's the anxious type, which is the other one to the avoidant. And there are mm. other, other ways. The person who learns, because these are often the most judged. So these will be the people I think will listen who will be like, oh, what do I do? Yeah. Um, these people maybe learned that when I'm distressed as a kid, someone will sometimes come and support me and sometimes <laughs> won't. Right. Right. So to manage that, yeah. rather than shutting down like the avoidant child, they continuously initiate interaction, knowing at some point I'm going to get it. Right. Right. That is. And they often end up being called the clingy kids. Being called what? Sorry. The clingy kids, like the needy kids, clingy. because they're constantly initiating interaction. That's interesting, and that would be interesting, I guess, for any teachers or carers you know when you notice that a child is quite clingy can that then be an indication that perhaps they don't feel very secure in their home environment and they you know sometimes get attended to and sometimes don't and then that's that's what's triggering this clinginess but not in a worrying way. yeah but not in a worrying way so for example okay. say you have a child who um uh, have an anxious attachment style. It doesn't mean their parents are necessarily doing anything wrong. It just means right. maybe they're missing their needs and the kid is therefore more anxious. So it's not a diagnostic, something bad is happening at the home. It's more mm -hmm. of a, oh, I think this kid needs some consistency. And as right. adults, um, yes, never judge your parents, uh, <laughs> like the parents on this, um, unless you know there's something bad happening. But as mm -hmm. adults, what's so fascinating is they might have been called clingy kids but as adults, they're often called needy. So the avoidant is like a cat God. and the um, anxious is more like a puppy. You know, when puppies jump up and down, like, hi, yeah. hi, I'm here, I'm here. here. Can I have a cuddle? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So when they date later on, if they think someone else is pulling away, they'll initiate more interaction. Now, the reason I told you this is because you were talking about, you know, if people can understand this, can they move forward? Are there things they can do? Absolutely. Once you know your attachment style, you can see, oh, I pull away the avoidant because I feel like someone's got too close. Mm. Or I lean in as an anxious person because I feel someone's pulling away. And then you can figure out what you need to do. So we can earn secure attachment. This means, for example, if we date someone with a secure attachment style, we often feel more grounded. 
if we're aware of our needs as an avoidant person, I need to be able to travel on my own and then come back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then as an anxious person, if I was sitting with someone who is anxious, I would need to listen to what they need, maybe more text messages, maybe more consistent communication from me. You can figure out what you need in life to feel safe in any relationship you're in. That is just that's that's so positive and and, and very em empowering, and you're talking here, I think, about a lot of different emotions that we feel. You know, what what is the purpose of emotions? Why why do we have them as 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 human beings? What's what what's the whole what's the point really of of, of emotional thought and emotional feelings? Um, I'm smiling so much because this is my probably my single favorite question. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so um, most people think that emotions arise in response to things happening in our life, right? So something good happens to you, you feel good. Something bad happens, mm -hmm. you feel bad. Yep. This isn't really the case. Emotions are physical responses that arise inside our body when our brain has predicted that something is in our environment that's either going to help us thrive or survive. So let's think about it. Say, for example, you're walking down the street and you smell a waft of something delicious mm. or you see the back of someone that you think oh, they're, they're, maybe they're delicious. I don't know. So your brain <laughs> predicts that there's some <laughs> meal on the horizon or potential, yeah. you know, someone to reproduce. Then you get this, um, your body is filled with feel good chemicals and hormones such as oxytocin, dopamine. And suddenly you have this urge to turn towards that thing. So your brain, mm -hmm. our species has evolved and survived by turning towards the things that are good for us. Then imagine walking down the street and you see your enemy, mm. right? Or you predict that you've seen your enemy or you open your phone and you see an email from your boss that says we need to talk and your brain predicts this means you're going to get fired. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. So now your body is instead being filled with adrenaline. You'll suddenly have the urge to either run away mm. <laughs> or turn towards that situation and fight for your life. And right. these are the emotions of anxiety, anger, and fear. So brain has evolved to predict what can go wrong, to make you run away from or fight against the things that would threaten your life. So emotions are incredibly important all of them are useful all of them there's no such thing are as they? good or bad emotion really and they are all there to keep us alive and safe right so even if we feel under pressure or we feel a, a bad reaction you know a, an emotional response mm -hmm. you know should we be kind of recognizing that and embracing it then and, and not 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 being too worried about it because it, it is there recognizing that it's there to protect us for the future. Absolutely. And that is kind of first line treatment of anyone who's struggling with their emotions is to recognize all your emotions are normal. Because I don't know if you've ever done this before, but as a rule, because we're raised to believe that happiness is the emotion to strive for. Mm. A lot of us, when we feel anger, anxiety, um, sadness, we don't just experience that primary emotion. We have an emotion about that emotion. Right. So, for example, you might feel yeah. angry and then you might feel ashamed for feeling angry or panicked yeah. that you felt angry. Then the emotion that was meant to be fleeting suddenly escalates into something much more painful. Yeah. So if, if we can know that all emotions have purpose, and all are safe, even though sometimes they're wrong. You know, I have mispredicted, you know, the email that comes through and say, we need to talk. And I'm like, oh, my job's, you know, my job's going to go. And it turns out they just genuinely needed to talk. <laughs> if we know our emotions are good for us, yes, that there's a reason we will stop doing that second arrowing, that bit where we go from anger to shame or that bit where we go from panic yeah. to even more panic. Yeah. So, yes, anyone listening, please remember all emotions are normal. <laughs> But, you know, that is that is so important. And I think, you know, particularly at the moment, you know, we've lived through such strange times these last 18 months and emotions have become so heightened. And in fact, only yesterday I was with a younger friend who uh, has has been suffering from extreme anxiety. I mean, really, really, uh, you know, almost kind of bed ridden with anxiety and then feels and has a layer now of anxiety about the anxiety 
and you know to your point feels ashamed mm -hmm. and and belittled and and unworthy of her anxiety which is then making her more anxious so you know that may be happening to somebody who's listening right now or it may be happening to somebody who you know how can we best support because mm -hmm. i have to be honest with you i wasn't really too sure what i could say other than be encouraging um, but, you know, to have some sort of words, you know, almost, you know, I guess, clinical psychology words of, of helpfulness. What would you be saying to somebody in that situation? Firstly, just empathizing. And I think, mm. you know, I think a lot of us, it's interesting. I have noticed that a lot of us now um, really want to connect to the people we know who are having a bad time. Yeah. But then get this just before we're about to connect and say something we have a secondary panic where we go oh, what if I say the wrong thing yes sure I absolutely felt yes. that yeah yeah I, I felt responsible you know for her yeah, mental so health and, and, and what I was going to say right? so that so then you say nothing yes. which is obviously yes, not, yes, not yes. helpful <laughs> yes 100% 100% so I think the first thing is always when anyone shares anything with you is just to say wow I'm so sorry you're going through this it sounds mm. incredibly difficult Mm. Like and it, then I always do a three part next line, which is apart mm -hmm. from thank you for telling me, which is do you want to talk about it? Right. Do you want me to help you problem solve, or do you want me to distract you? Because I can do any of these three, and I am just right. here for you, whatever you need. So you give them the choice, you know, to either talk and just sit and listen, to you know, kind of brainstorm some potential solutions or some ways out of it, which I guess for me, I always kind of try and fix things. So that that's my default position. So I'd be the one out there with a pencil and paper going, right, OK, let's let's create a mind map and see what we can do. Um, or, you know, I love that. I hadn't thought about that. Or can I distract you? You know, let's let's go for a walk. Let's sit and watch watch something funny on on you know a box set, or let's cook something. Or do you want to go and grab a coffee? You know, just something yeah. that, that that is a distraction. What a really great idea! So to have those three choices, basically. People... Mm. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, firstly, I'm I I I have that pull sometimes as well to fix. I'm like, oh no, what can I do to make it better? Yeah. And I think when you care about someone, it's even more intense, that feeling. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And you really, you know, you just want to gather around somebody. What about people who are on their own now, who are listening to this and, and this is something that's mm. happening to them or they want to share it with somebody who they know is affected and, and being on their own? What are the kind of helpful coping strategies for this? And also perhaps the not so helpful strategies that we should be avoiding? Mm. Okay, so there's those are kind of two questions in the sense of if you're struggling with panic, I'm going to answer that kind of firstly. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that we could all benefit from doing, whether you're experiencing distress or um, whether you're someone who just wants to understand yourself, because you are going to come across distressed people at some point, and it is yeah. likely you will experience it too at some point. Mm. I think we could all do with, I was going to say all do with reading my book to understand all of this. Of but course. Uh, actually, <laughs> that's a given. Um, all do with <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I talk about these exact things is why I yeah. say that. But if we could all get to grips with understanding the fight, flight, freeze, spawn response, this kind of what happens in our body when we're under pressure, when we're in uncertainty. If we could all understand that and equip ourselves with the most basic coping skills that we know work, such mm -hmm. as grounding exercises, breathing exercises, and if you want to continue it, it gets more complex mindfulness and compassion. Can we just re we recap on, on, on those four points? It was fight, flight, free? Freeze, fawn. Freeze. Freeze. Okay, fine. And fawn. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar, yeah, but for anybody who's, who, who, who's yes. not familiar, can we do a very, very quick one line on, on each of those, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn? Yes. Yes, 100%. So um, our ancestors basically would have run, from danger and that's when mm -hmm. you and I our heart is racing and we want to escape a situation that's fl fi uh, flight flight <laughs> fight mm -hmm. they would have fought against the danger that's when you and I want to turn around and feel aggressive turn towards mm -hmm. the problem freeze that's when you become totally frozen to the spot almost feel like you're paralyzed your brain feels like it's gone offline you're totally foggy maybe dissociated and the final one which very few people know about is fawn and this is when you're in danger 
or feel under threat in some way. And the way that you're going to cope with it is by complying with or pleasing the person who's putting you in danger. Mm -hmm. We often see this in movies, actually. Have you ever seen a film where, um, for example, someone's got a gun and the other person at first tries to run and they realize yeah. it doesn't work. So then they try to fight against it. They realize that doesn't work. Then they become totally panicked. And then they start yes. going, oh, you're so like, then maybe I could be on your side. You're so smart. Maybe like keep me alive right. and I'll help you. I'll work for you. So those are the four stages of threat response that mm -hmm. humans go through. And so recognizing those presumably is is the, the, the first kind of helpful strategy and then deciding which ones that you're going to do. So do we have a choice then of as to which one of those four that we slip into? No, not at all, um, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Basically, your brain decides. So, for example, say the threat that you perceive is far away, you're more likely to slip into something like fight or flight. You'll become anxious, start becoming hypervigilant for danger. You might be preparing to run or to fight. If the danger is very, very close to you, you will respond you know, you will run, for example, without realizing, you know, when you step out into the street and you hear a car in the distance, mm -hmm. and you jump out the way. Mm -hmm. That's your brain taking over. If the threat is ir inescapable, you'll slip into freeze. And then at the end, you might slip into fawn. However, if as a child you used any of these frequently, they will be your first line of defense as an adult. Right. So it's interesting because actually when people experience trauma as adults, when, for example, um, I see a lot of people experience a lot of shame saying, for example, I was in this life or death scenario and I froze totally to the spot. Mm, yeah. I imagined that in that kind of scenario, I would have fought, I would have found a way to stop it. Mm. And a lot of therapists are doing a lot of work around unpacking that shame because there is nothing shameful about slipping into freeze. You did not choose. You could be Jackie Chan, you know, or Bruce Lee right. or someone with serious, okay. serious martial arts skills and still be faced with a knife or a gun and just totally power down. And it's because your brain thinks, oh my word, we're in such threat that we need to play dead and we need to bring all of the blood away from the surface in case we get cut so that we minimize the amount of blood loss and keep you safe. And you go numb so that you won't feel the pain. My goodness. And all that is happening on a totally automatic level. It, it's not something that we can control. Yeah. Can we learn to override it? I no. mean, I know people talk about kind of, you know, self-defense classes and things like that. I mean, is it, are, they, are, they, are they not worth doing then? Oh, one, no, no, 100%. You know, um, so going back to your previous question, I just want mm. people to understand these four, not to panic them, but so that you know, like your friend, for example, who's going through anxiety, like, oh, these feelings in my body are not dangerous. I do not need to be ashamed of them. My brain thinks I'm in danger and now I'm afraid of this feeling. So I've started a vicious cycle. So the way oh, I need to yeah. go forwards is these coping skills, like grounding and breathing. Or someone mm -hmm. else who froze, it'd be like, oh, I don't need to feel ashamed. It was purely because I was in this situation. Mm. But you ask, can we train ourselves? Firstly, yes. <laughs> okay. The more, okay. for example, someone who has panic knows they use grounding or breathing exercises, when they start to feel the fight or flight come on, they slip into doing the breathing exercises and that system mm -hmm. shuts down. Likewise, mm. our military, for example, they go into war or they go yeah. into battle having done so many drills, you know, practicing, right. they get up, they get dragged out of their bed. I don't know anyone in the military, but I imagine it because I've seen yeah. the movies being pulled out of bed at four a.m. and made to do things. And that that training clearly is is exactly that, isn't it? It's training their brains to cope yeah. with that extreme situation because yeah. you couldn't expect someone just to, to turn it on. Yeah. they need to have done that repeated, exactly. repeated, repeated action to make them instinctively comfortable yeah. with with behaving like that. I mean, what a trauma you can for them. Logic. Yeah. 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 You Very can't logic. Once you're in freeze, you can't logic your way out. Yeah. So if you have, um, so it's funny because when I had panic attacks, um, I almost, when I look back at that time, imagine I had my breathing exercises in my ears 24 seven. I don't even know for how many months. And it was a bit like a soldier, right? I was drill training these breathing exercises so that right. when I slipped into autopilot, yeah. such as panic, I also slipped into the automatic responding of, mm. 
So would you say then that breathing exercises uh, are useful for all of us to learn, regardless of whether or not we are feeling anxious or panicked by things, just so that we've got them in our repertoire to, to call on in the future when inevitably there is going to be a need? Oh my word, yes. If we were taught breathing exercises in school, so mm. they were second nature, and doing them yeah. as adults when we're already struggling, it would change people's lives. You know, if you imagine you or I, so both our scenarios, when you were in, um, when you were in the shop yeah. and I experienced my first panic, if it came on and we didn't go, I'm dying. What is this? Like, yes. Oh, hi, yeah. panic. Yes. Oh, hi, panic. This feels terrible, but I've got my breathing exercises. We would have had very different experiences. Yes. So breathing exercises are good for everyone, I'm going to put one caveat in. Mm. <laughs> and this is why I should teach it when young. If someone has um, experienced a level of physical trauma where they don't feel safe focusing on their body, which does happen for some people, mm -hmm. doing a breathing exercise, which requires you to focus on the breath as it comes in and out of you, may be too intense. Right. So actually, the kind of first line is that all of us could do with learning a grounding exercise such as the 54321. Do you know it? No, tell me. OK, so all it involves is looking around you and saying five things that you can see and you say them out loud. So I can see a fig tree, a window. The next thing is you say four things you can touch and you actually touch them. I'm touching a table. It's kind of smooth. Then you say three things you can hear, two things that you can smell, one thing you can taste. And this wow. means that if you're in a state of distress, if you're feeling mm -hmm. that kind of roller coaster of emotion, your brain is looking outside of you, getting all these lovely cues that say you're safe, it is stable, and it yes. soothes your system quickly. I love that. Let me get that into my head. So five things that I can see, four things I can touch, three things yes. that I can hear, <laughs> two things that I can smell, and one thing that I can taste. If very, yeah. and it very that interesting. And, I mean, even, even if, I mean, I'm sitting here and I, I can't actually taste anything, but I mean, I can just taste, I don't know, nothing. I mean, Your what, mouth, what? Though, right? My mouth, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm just tasting my mouth, but I'm, obviously if I had something else, <laughs> You know, to put in it, I might taste a, you know, biscuit or a piece of apple or something or a cup of coffee. But yes, how very interesting. And I can I see so that much coffee. <laughs> that's not good for jangly nerves, is it? <laughs> um, but I can see how that absolutely would would take you out of yourself. And then, so you do that first. Yeah. Do that. That's the grounding, the outward grounding, yeah. and then you do the inward breathing. And I've also heard it mm, said, if you can manage it, if you can manage it. And is it true that we need to, just as a general rule with that, to breathe out for longer than we breathe in to activate our kind of parasympathetic oh, yes. system? Mm. That <laughs> is music I got top marks on that one. So few people know that. Yes, full <laughs> marks. Oh, my word, exactly. Uh, yes. In an ideal world. The, um, absolutely. So if you think about the fact that um, when you slip into fight, fight and flight, your body is preparing you to run or to fight for your life. It's trying to get mm -hmm. as much oxygen in as possible. No, That's you why you can hyperventilate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Because it's trying to prepare you to run or fight when the reality is most of us experience this in an, a situation where we're definitely not going to run or fight. So to slow that system down, we have to do the opposite, right? So we slow our breathing down, even though your brain is probably saying, I'm not getting enough air, promise you, you are, your muscles are just tense and you're breathing into the top of your lungs. So you try and practice breathing in through your nose and mm -hmm. out through your mouth as if you're whistling or as if you're trying to blow candles, but not blow the candle out. You want to just make okay. the little flame on top flicker. So you go... And that limits the amount of oxygen you're intaking so you can't hyperventilate. Mm. And then you breathe out for longer, exactly as you said, mm. to really slow down that process and keep going with the CO2. So I do in for four, hold for one, out for six, hold for one. 
Right. But again, because there's always caveats and there's ways that we make it work for everyone. When you're panicking, remembering 4161 can be really hard. <laughs> yes. Okay, but just, yeah, like it's that, just, really difficult. just that idea of, of slowing it down, taking a little breath in, yeah. a longer breath I out. Really fascinating. Yes, and so the Marines, for example, a lot of lots of soldier stuff here do box breathing. So you just imagine you're breathing in along the top of a box for four, out like hold along the top of a side of box for four, out for the four, hold for four. Do you see what I mean? So then you've got the same number of breaths all the way around, and it right. just stops the kind of cognitive overload. Okay, and you're imagining that you're tracing the line around the box as you as you breathe. Mm -hmm. Sophie, it's so fascinating to to chat to you. I mean, I have so enjoyed our, our discussion here today. I've learned huge amounts, and I think it's really positive that we've finished with some practical things that everybody can do because they're free and they are they are within all of us, hopefully, to to be able to do. Huge success with your book. Um, the first, I'm sure, of many now. Do you think? Well, I got a two book deal after writing the most in-depth book I ever imagined and assumed because I wouldn't get another chance to, I'd write the most <laughs> in-depth book and then they signed me for two. So yes, there'll be a second book coming out in 2023. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I look forward to talking to you about that, if not before. And thank you again very much for being a contributor to the current issue of the magazine. It's a really interesting article for anybody who wants to follow up on that as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. It was a real treat. And that is it for today's episode. Huge thanks to Dr. Soph. And as always, you will find the links and the resources that we mentioned today over on lizalwellbeing.com. And there you can sign up for the free weekly newsletter that is jam-packed with tips for living well, including huge amounts there also on mental health and strategies to help cope with everything that's going on around us at the moment, both physically, emotionally and mentally. Very many thanks to all of those who have left such lovely reviews, especially on iTunes. It really does help others to find the show and perhaps also to help them find the help that they need. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye bye. The Liz Earle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Liz Earle, with production by Amaryllis Earle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue, with thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière.